In early 2020, Lee Wannell raked in over $100 million at the box office on just a $7 million budget and breathed new life into Universal's previously comatose Dark Universe. Go. And he did it by <gasps> scaring the pants off of us with Invisible Man, which is an incredible feat considering the villain is, well, invisible. How is it that lead Elizabeth Moss could have us peeking through our fingers with fear from just gazing across an empty kitchen? How did Steven Spielberg and John Williams send chills down our collective spines with just two notes on the piano? And why does Hitchcock's swirl of blood in black and white still have us checking who else is in the bathroom every time we step into the shower? So let's break down what exactly scares us at the movies today and how that's evolved over time. The history of horror on screen dates back to before the golden age of Hollywood, but our concept of a horror movie really kicked off with Universal's monster films. It's alive! Dracula, Frankenstein, The Mummy, and yes, The Invisible Man, all released in the early 1930s and gave birth not just to some of the oldest film franchises on screen, but also gave us one of the defining ways that filmmakers would employ to terrify us for decades to come. In this case, monsters. Any horror movie or horror hybrid can be broken down into one of these essential scare tactics. Monsters, suspense, gore, the sudden or unexpected, and the idea that seemingly ordinary aspects of our lives are in fact terrifying. And although there's overlap and exceptions, these subgenres also mirror the progression of horror films over the decades. Universal Studios kicked things off with their monster movies in what would become known as their dark universe. I am Dracula. Although Dracula is considered the kickoff of the Universal Monster series, the studio's founder, Carl Lamell Jr., really set the mold earlier when he produced The Phantom of the Opera. This 1925 silent film adaptation of The Phantom of the Opera also gave us our first jump scare on screen, but more on that later. Where the early monster movies just presented a villain built to scare and didn't focus on the bloody acts they were committing, as horror films became more prevalent, Frankenstein's scarred face would prove not enough to get audiences on the edge of their seats. It was time to bring on the blood. Many early Hollywood films leaned into horror and gore and their popularity inadvertently derailed that part of the genre for years. Todd Browning's Freaks in 1932 was so horrific, even after several edits, it prompted Hollywood to enact the Hayes Production Code, which cut down on the sex, gore, and violence that we horror fans have come to know and love. In response to the Hayes Codes, filmmakers had to rely on innuendo, clever camera work, scoring, and the use of dread and suspense to horrify film fans. The artistry behind that became the norm, and no one did it better than the master himself, Alfred Hitchcock. We all go a little mad sometimes. Haven't you? Let's take a peek at his infamous shower scene from Psycho, a moment from a movie that is so iconic it is the basis of an entire documentary and has been imitated countless times. A moment of violence with very little blood or gore that suggests an idea so unnerving movies themselves would never be the same. Hitchcock was dubbed the master of suspense, and if you just have a listen to his bomb theory, you'll understand why. Four people are sitting around a table, talking about baseball, whatever you like. Suddenly, a bomb goes off. What do the audience have? 10 seconds of shock. Now take the same scene and tell the audience there is a bomb under that table and will go off in five minutes. Well, the whole emotion of the audience is totally different because you've given them that information. That type of suspense is what John Krasinski used in A Quiet Place. The opening sequence is essentially a cinematic way of communicating that there's a bomb in the floorboards without saying anything. 
We see the family scared and silent. We know there's a reason why they can't talk, and then the spaceship becomes the ticking bomb. Oh, that poor kid. For 30 years, the Hayes Code of straight edge filmmaking was the law of the land, and during that time, filmmakers like Hitchcock, Stanley Kubrick, Billy Wilder, and others used creative methods to incite fear while keeping things PG. Open the pod bay doors, Hal. I'm sorry, Dave. I'm afraid I can't do that. I mean, look at 1944's Gaslight, which gave Ingrid Bergman her first Oscar win and gave the internet some new slang. It's the dread the audience feels will happen to our heroine that hooks us. Bergman gives great face as she despairs and questions if what she's seeing is real. I can see you still, standing there and saying, look, look at this letter and staring at nothing. What? You had nothing in your hand. This is the reverse of what happens to Elizabeth Moss in The Invisible Man, but the dread created is the same. In the 2020 film, we don't feel dread over whether she'll figure it out, it's more the dread that no one will believe her and the other horrors inflicted upon her. James, it was him. He's here, I no, swear to enough. you. Enough. <laughs> See, enough. This is the same reason why we fall in love with the final girls that nobody believes like Laurie Strode, Ellen Ripley, and Sidney Prescott. Well, at least we do if they don't have sex, but uh, more on that later. Besides using dread and suspense to ratchet up the scares, Gaslight also employed one of the other tried and true ways to scare the audience by making the spouse the villain. Suddenly, nothing is safe. Not your partner, not even the things and places around you. In the hands of a horror master, something innocuous in normal life becomes sinister on screen, like birds or the sound of wind, spiders or heights, or even your childhood doll or pet. <gasps> Several horror masters reveled in the idea that life is more disturbing than the most evil movie monster. Sometimes that meant you should fear birds. Sometimes that meant you should fear the system we live in or how we live in it. Jordan Peele used the horrors of racism and the marginalization of black Americans to create the sunken place. So the movie for me became almost about representation within the genre, within itself in a weird way. Ari Aster used the cult subgenre to turn the idea of a fun summer vacation on its head and to explore grief and toxic masculinity, all while featuring a ton of gore as, well, just a bonus. <laughs> And just earlier this year, Natalie Erica James framed Alzheimer's as a gruesome horror plot point for the equally terrifying relic. Camera, scoring, lighting, nice boy. dread, and the presence of monsters all work to ignite fear. But it can't be overstated just how much can be achieved with the right application of red corn syrup over pigskin. In the 2000s, films like Hostel, Audition, and Saw reminded audiences what the Texas Chainsaw Massacre and slasher films knew all too well. Blood and gore can terrify people to their core. John Carpenter, Dario Argento, Roger Corman, and George Romero gave birth to a new era in horror filmmaking and solidified the horror tropes that are now as familiar as A-list stars. And speaking of familiar, we couldn't go any further without <laughs> mentioning the horror tactic that gets the most flack but remains to this day the most effective, the jump scare. The shock of the unexpected crashing noise or leaping villain is a quick and cheap way to get screams. If a monster or ghost story doesn't have at least a handful, it's shocking. Using camera work and sound, a director can, in just a few quick moments, change the energy around any moment. And that shock is not just reserved for monsters jumping out of a closet. Look at the ending of the first Saw film, when Jigsaw gets up after Carrie Yules has cut off his foot. 
The shock in that moment rivals just about everything that happened up to that point as far as how much it affected us. Game over. The same can be said for Robert Edgar's The Witch. Though primarily an atmospheric horror film, Edgar splices quick cuts of disturbing pagan imagery into the nearly silent film as just another way to keep the audience ill at ease. But every aspect of a horror film becomes a trope after a certain amount of time. The virginal heroine, sin equals death. There are certain rules that one must abide by in order to successfully survive a horror movie. Yes, basically all the rules from Scream took hold in the 1970s and audiences could not get enough of the midnight madness double feature horror films that filmmakers like Quentin Tarantino would go on to celebrate and recreate or rip off, depending on who you ask. But by the time we reach the 1990s and Jamie Kennedy forever ruined most of the horror staples filmmakers had relied on for so long, the latest and most effective mode to terrorize us rose to prominence. Get out! Yo! Ah! Yo! Chill, Get out! And that was the subversion of expectations which is the entire premise of Cabin in the Woods. Spoiler alert, the film lives in the standard teen horror model until the big reveal in which we find out the events up until that point are in fact a tribute to the Ancient Ones, a cruel group of subterranean deities who are trying to determine if humanity is worth saving. I'm sorry I let you get attacked by a werewolf and then into the world. You were right. Humanity. And based on the current state of events, I have to agree with the final scene and say, probably not. And in the end, the subversion of expectations is where we're scaring people most these days. As movie audiences became more sophisticated, horror directors had to work harder to get the desired effect, making the ordinary seem extraordinarily terrifying or scary. Don't open the door. See, everything's okay. Jordan Peele used the image of our worst selves unleashed upon us in Us a thousand times scarier than if it was just another Freddy styled villain slicing up the town. Don't burn our house down. And Julie Ducor gave vegans and carnivores something to chew on with her cannibalistic, gory coming-of-age tale, Raw. Subverting our expectations is the hallmark of most successful modern-day horror directors. They call on the ancestors and borrow just enough to set the stage and then pull away the rules that they have lived by to keep us guessing and screaming at the movie magic they've created. And what was this year's most successful horror film? The Invisible Man. Wanell's masterful in setting expectations and then making them disappear. He crafts a symphony of scares by employing every scare tactic we've mentioned. Jump scares are set up, but never happen, leaving us on edge. Good people die, bad people live. The movie is an old school bloodless suspense thriller until we swim in pools of the stuff. And crucially, in the biggest twist of the tale, the focus is not on the man, but on a woman. The terror, almost a century after Universal started the genre, is not what is becoming of him, but what he's doing to her. By flipping the script, Wano found a fresh way to frighten us and a path forward for horror filmmakers, something horror fans who thought they knew the genre inside and out, well, never saw coming. <laughs>